Howdy. I'm Andy Card, the interim CEO of the George and Barbara Bush Foundation, located on the campus of Texas A&M University, right next to the Bush School of Government and Public Service and the Presidential Library of George Bush and this museum. So we're fortunate to have this day today where we can participate with a virtual event where we're going to hear from a New York Times White House correspondent and author, Peter Baker, and his wife, Susan Glasser, who is a staff writer for The New Yorker. And the book that they wrote is The Man Who Ran Washington, The Life and Times of James A. Baker III. Jim Baker is one of my heroes and a mentor. But more significantly, he truly served this country and so many presidents so well that he changed the world. But significantly, he made a difference in the life of George H.W. Bush as his truly best friend. So we're going to hear about that discussion of the man who did change Washington, D.C. and the world. And the conversation today with Susan and Peter will be moderated by presidential historian and best-selling author Michael Beschloss. He's an award-winning historian, a scholar of leadership, and best-selling author of 10 books. Most recently, he won a claim from the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal for presidents of war. So with respect for all of you, Michael, the stage is yours to begin this unbelievably important discussion. So I look forward to hearing about the living giant who's made a difference in public service, James A. Baker III. Michael, take it away. First of all, thank you so much to all of our friend, Andy Card, for that very nice introduction of all of us. And, uh, thrilled to be here with my dear friends Susan and Peter. Just before we started, I was talking about the fact, how many blocks are we from each other at this moment? <laughs> Just really a, a few hundred yards, basically. Yeah, a few hundred <laughs> yards. Uh, we could have done this, if it were not for the quarantine, we could have done this, the three of us sitting side by side, uh, no. uh, which yeah. I'm sorry about, but I hope that will happen one day very soon. Uh, now, everyone who's watching and listening, I just want to tell you why we're doing this tonight. The problem, I have to first say, I'll say it more than once tonight, Man Who Ran Washington, one of the best books I have re ever read. I sat down intending to start it, and I think I got up maybe four hours later, could, literally could not put it down. People actually say that, but really happened in this case. <laughs> Everyone watching this will love it and be astounded by the amount of work that was done. But the problem is, the book was published, what, nine days ago? <laughs> Yeah, something like that. Nine yeah. days ago, and the problem is, it has gotten no attention. <laughs> no one has praised it. No one has put the authors on their TV shows or radio shows. Uh, it's just, it's, it's not being sold. So we thought, you know, sort of as, as a matter of charity, nine days in, we'd have this hour with our friends who are here with the Bush Foundation just to give the book a little bit of attention just in case there is one person listening uh, who thinks I'm in even remotely serious, the <laughs> first bestseller list from the New York Times on which this book could have appeared was last night. And the book, of course, has appeared. Uh, and that is extremely well-deserved. So congratulations to both of you and everything that's been said and written about the book. I don't think I've ever seen a book that is literally more universally acc acclaimed. Now the audience, I'm sure, is really desperate for me to read maybe a 12-minute a biography of the two authors uh, <laughs> sent by their publisher, which I don't have anyway. Uh, <laughs> if I did, I wouldn't read it because everyone knows Peter and Susan. They know what they have achieved. And I think we would all rather hear them talk about the book. So with the permission of our audience, rather than read you a long introduction of two people who need no introduction, I thought I'd talk a little bit about how they came to write this book, and then we'd just walk through Jim Baker's life through the eyes of these two biographers who have been able to gather so much information on him that I had no idea of before and analyze him in a way that I had not seen before and really led us into the life of Jim Baker in a way that's absolutely fresh. And I guess obviously the first question is, how did you all decide to do this book in the first place? 
Well, thank you very much, Michael, for doing this with us. We can't tell you how honored we are to have you as a moderator. Love it. Equal to the Bush family, the Bush Foundation, to Secretary Card, everybody for, for making this happen. All, all the people who are attending tonight, we know you have better things to do, and so it's a great uh, treat. One of the things I would say, by the way, just to start off with, the interest in this in some ways started almost 20 years ago when Susan and I moved to Moscow for the Washington Post. We moved to the bureau. So that was liter literary what year, Peter? 2000, at the end of 2000, early 2001. Uh -huh. And when we arrived in the bureau there, we found on the bookshelf <laughs> That's true. A, a ratty old uh, galley. galley. It wasn't even the full book <laughs> of a book called The Highest Levels. Oh my God. By one you were really scraping the bottom of the barrel. Talbot. And we read that book there in That's Moscow true. and we loved it. And we were like, how come? No, this book is a fantastic book because Michael and Strobe. Talbot had really had unique access to these figures at, as the end of the Cold War was playing out, right. uh, both on the Soviet side right. with Gorbachev and his circle, and also with Secretary Baker. Right. No, so oh, I'm thanks. Not, we had a great time doing it. We're not joking, but that book was so inspirational to us. And, it, and, it, it, and, and when we came back to do this book in 2013, we went back, of course, and it was a foundational resource for us to understand Baker and Bush in this extraordinary three year, four year period when the world changed. And uh, we don't, we, there's so much we couldn't match, frankly. I don't think we actually added very much to what Michael and Strobe had about that particular period, but there's so much there else. Are, Peter, anyone who knows Peter, he is so unbelievably unnecessarily modest. Uh, don't I, listen to a word. <laughs> I mean, this is the, folks, this is the difference between history and the book that he's re kindly referring to came out at about the time of these events. Peter has gotten Jim Baker's papers, got everyone to talk. This is a totally new and exciting view. Well, we were lucky. We did approach Secretary Baker in 2013. I should say Peter and Susan. I'm just looking at Peter. We had um, we were talking in 2013 about what book we were thinking about doing. We were looking around thinking, who's a big, important Washington figure whose story is interesting that hasn't really been told in the broadest sense? And we were actually stunned when we realized that Jim Baker, who was Secretary of State at the end of the Cold War, Rita would fight Germany, Gulf War, Madrid peace process, and by the way, ran five presidential campaigns. Right. Never been the subject of a full biography. It was actually stunning. And so yeah. we went to see him to see if he would be uh, willing to cooperate, and he was. And this, this is around when? 2013, end of 2013. So you went down to Houston? Yep, exactly. Uh -huh. And he was really open. I mean, Susan can talk uh -huh. about it. Like, we were, a lot of people have write, written biographies, people who are alive, and they, live to regret it because writing biographies of people who are still around, you know, subjects you to a whole lot of factors that aren't necessarily pleasant. You're a biography. very brave man. Most biographers would want to, would not want to write about a living yeah. subject. But Baker and, and, and Susan, a brave woman, she's being very quiet through this, <laughs> but. Uh, well, Baker was, I thought, very much the opposite of that. We had nothing to fear. Is that right? Well, it's interesting. I mean, you know, he had a, such a formidable reputation for being such a careful steward of his own image mm -hmm. uh, and really stage managing and being brilliant at manipulating the press. So I don't know, maybe we've been brilliantly manipulated. Uh, but yeah. I will say this, that, you know, he's 90 years old. So most of the time we're working with him in his mid to late 80s, completely not only on the ball, but I do think that there was a, a form of, you know, recognition I've written two of my own memoirs. I've had my say. Uh, and he's, he's a very savvy person. And I think that he understood that to really be regarded as a historic figure worthy uh, of attention for a long time to come, you need to have an independent book about you. Your right. own memoirs are not sufficient. And I think- And, and even that tells a lot about him because yeah, many public does. figures are not that shrewd to understand that. I agree. I think that was very revealing. And he, mm -hmm. he made a commitment. He understood it was not an authorized book. He wasn't going to get to read it in advance. He lived up to that commitment. He, uh, you know, his whole family, eight children, uh, we spoke with, uh, you know, his whole uh, circle, his 106 year old nanny. I mean, you know, he opened his papers at Princeton and at Rice. Uh, for us, which really was a source of a lot of new and interesting information. Uh, and so, you know, it was really a great experience, especially because Peter and I did not cover him in his heyday. You know, we were just coming to Washington uh, in this period at the end of the Cold War. That's, you know, I graduated from college the year that the Berlin Wall fell. Uh, and so that was the other part of our impetus to do this book, I think, Michael, is that 
both Peter and I saw it as a chance to really write a story about Washington writ large when Washington ran the world. Here's the man who ran Washington at this moment in time and to try to explore, in fact, which part was the man, which part was the moment and, you know, how much uh, were they interdependent. And you can't get really a character who tells that story of Washington from the end of Watergate to it's the unbelievable. end of the war. And really, he's, and for everything. decades, he's at the center. Yes. You know, usually in history, a figure like this is maybe at the center of things for two or three years, yes. assuming it's someone who's not president. And I knew this, but when I read the book, it just really brought home to me how much he's been at the center of really everything, really since the mid 1970s, wouldn't you say? He really was. He was kind of the belly in some ways of, of, of Washington politics. All the major events in the last contested Republican convention, all the way right. through the Iraq study group, right, where he's trying right. to help George W. Bush figure out a way to go forward with a war that isn't going well. And so all the way basically through a quarter century, any major event in Washington has his fingerprints. Right, absolutely. Well, why don't we go back to the beginning? Tell about his family in Texas. What kind of a house did he grow up in? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, not not a modest one, not a modest family, not a modest house. And, you know, of course, there's probably many people on this uh, call who know the story far better than we do. But I will say this, I, you know, different people approach biographies different ways. I'm definitely a reader of biographies who likes the first part of the book best, always. Uh, and I, you know, am right? You usually pick up a biography of a, a, a big person because you're familiar in some way, at least with their dazzling resume or their accomplishments. And in this case as well, you know, I really didn't know anything. And I don't think, you know, Peter did either about how Jim Baker came to be, what made him who he was. And, you know, so the first thing to know about Baker, of course, is that he's a very accidental Washington figure. And, uh, you know, the world's most successful mid -career, midlife career change basically uh you know so and, and what was the advice that he got uh, well exactly his family <laughs> was vehemently opposed to politics and in fact they had this family motto passed down several generations work hard study hard and stay out of politics which he made the title of his second memoir just tongue-in-cheek but understanding that politics was actually more of an act of rebellion in some ways against the constraints uh that he grew up with uh, I think was a real insight for us. But, you know, Baker was the son, the grandson, and the great-grandson of uh, not just lawyers in Houston, but really, you know, institution builders, people who created, uh, in many ways, a lot of the architecture of modern Houston. One of the big mysteries, though, we never saw was why he's James Baker III, if he's really James Baker IV. <laughs> we never figured that out. Yes, family lore has it that they couldn't count, but that's sort of an <laughs> institutional explanation. Maybe more helpful in politics. One question I've got, and you answer it in the book, but just to create some artificial suspense for our <laughs> audience, where does the ambition come from? I mean, in most of the figures that I have studied in life who become great leaders who get elected president, they usually have these really tough childhoods and things that they have to overcome. And a lot of their lives, you can go back to the first few years and say, you know, these are the obstacles that were put in their way that made them want to you know, become something as a way of overcoming that. Now, what it reminded me a little bit was, you may know about this, there was once a profile done of Eleanor Roosevelt's early life, and just till she was something like 20 years old, and it was given to a group of psychologists without <laughs> saying who it was. And they all said, it, it, they were all asked what happened to her, and they all saw this horrible early life and they said, she probably was institutionalized because her early years were so terrible. Yeah, so right. what I'm saying is if you read something about Jim Baker's first 15 or 20 years, this is not someone I would see as necessarily a high achiever or a future secretary of state. Is there anything in that first 15 years that you feel went against him or caused this kind of ambition, which to my mind is a positive thing? Absolutely. And, you know, he was a child of great privilege, but um, this was also a very constraining and duty-bound environment. Not only did he have the stultifying uh, legacy of his 
father, and in particular his grandfather, who was still this larger than life figure when he was a young boy, Captain Baker, you know, he had the family seat, all the grandchildren were expected to come there twice a week. He was a very regal and imperious figure. His father's whole life, in fact, had been shaped uh, and he'd been ordered around by his father, Captain Baker, his father had been a World War I hero, uh, unbelievable stories of what he had to do uh, in the trenches in World War I. He comes back and his father bosses him around and basically says, no, you can't be a litigator like you wanna be. I essentially want you uh, to be not a real lawyer, but the kind of lawyer who tends to the family business and be a bank president. The bottom line is actually, it's a story familiar to certainly any presidential historian as you are. Uh, it's all about the dad. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, he called his father, he and his friends called his father the warden. Uh, right. and, uh, you know, his father uh, was was a very, very uh, tough dad uh, who was, you know, pouring cold water on him if he didn't get up early enough on a Saturday morning, uh, who was ordering, bossing him around well into his young adulthood, uh, you know, in Princeton. Uh, in the archives, one of the most revealing things was his father. He's a grown man. He's married. He has his own children. He's working at a law firm. Uh, his dad controls the family money, sending him checks for like $25 here towards a Bro Brooks Brothers suit. And, you know, here's to pay for your wife's Christmas present. Uh, and it was, it was really, he told him when he went to law school at the University of Texas, uh, he made him pledge an undergraduate fraternity that his father had been in. Baker said, I don't want to do that, Dad. You know, I, I've been in the Marines. I'm, I'm, you know, no. And he was having freshmen hazing him because his father ordered him. So I think that the fact that he then rebelled against the family creed, once his father uh, really was ill and uh, unable to, to do anything about it, uh, tells you an awful lot about um, how he ended up being who he is. And his mm -hmm. friend, George Bush, by the way. I'm sorry, and his, yes, which I want to get to in a second. So if you're looking at Jim Baker in his 20s, you know, let's say you travel back through time and you're able to meet him, what do you think his ambitions are for his life in his 20s? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, the legacy of the family, you know, lived large on his shoulders. I think he felt he was going to be in the family business. He was disappointed when Baker Botts wouldn't allow him to come work there as a lawyer because of a nepotism rule. He was kind of crushed. Right. That he wasn't, and he goes, to, he goes, of course, to Andrews Kurth instead and tries to have to make his name on his own. He later acknowledges he thinks that was actually the best thing for him because he had he gone to his father's firm and succeeded. Everybody would have said, well, that's because of your dad. If he had right. failed, it would have been an embarrassing moment. He could make his way in on his own to some extent at Andrews mm -hmm. and Kurth. But he had a family, had four boys. I think he, you know, wanted to, to expect it to be, you know, another baker in Houston. I think it took a while so something else kind of began to tick in his brain. And it did start on the country club courts of Houston where he met you know, a young oilman named George H.W. Bush. In 1957? Yeah, in the late 50s, yeah, I forgot. Yeah, these play, playing, I, I've always loved the term customer tennis with the pro. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, he knows who's supposed to win. All right, so we've got a big scene coming up, which is George Bush meets Jim Baker. How did it happen and what was the result? You know, there are conflicting accounts. Uh, there were family connections uh, through um, uh, Baker's wife, his first wife, Mary Stewart, who grew up in Ohio. Uh, and uh, there was uh, an aunt, someone named Teensy Bush. Teensy Bush, uh, <laughs> cousin Teensy. Uh, cousin Teensy, who, who, you know, said, uh, George and Barbara, you got to meet these lovely young. Is that like uh, in Day Dayton, maybe? Dayton, yes. Ohio. That's no, that's what, what I thought. Yeah. That's right. exactly right. Uh, but, you know, look, it, I think it was the country club. And when uh, we were working on the book, Baker took us to lunch there one day at the Houston Country Club. And his favorite stop, you know, right after lunch, he said, well, let me show you. I'll tell you the real story. And he shows us in the hallway where they have, you know, all the winners of all the tennis tournaments and going what, way back. Going way back. <laughs> and what you notice, uh, of course, is not only, by the way, is this one of two country clubs that uh, his grandfather was a founder of. Uh, there is Jim Baker's name as a singles champion two years in a row right before George Bush came. So the other thing to know about both of these two is that they're fanatically competitive. Mm -hmm. And I think that was also something that Baker got from his father, uh, and especially on tennis. His father had been a tennis champion also at the Houston Country Club. Again, you know, this is really like, you know, 
some pretty heavy stuff here, right? And so George Bush comes and he's got his father who's a senator, uh, you know, and he's come all the way to Texas in order to make his own name. Uh, and I think that was something the two had in common, but also he sees on the wall, well, hey, this guy, you know, Jim Baker, he clearly is a good player. So maybe he'll be a good doubles partner for me. And so they got along well, the families got along well, they became close personally. But George Bush at that point, as you write about, uh, probably, I think, wanted to be president beginning in the <laughs> 1950s. Not out of incessant ambition. His father felt that he was cut out for it. This is something that was within his ability. And I think he always wanted to go into public service. There's no sign that Jim Baker had any idea at that point of running for office. Where was Jim Baker politically in Texas in the early 1960s. He was a Democrat. Right. Everybody in Texas was a Democrat in those days. It was just sort of the way it was. But he grew up in a house that was very skeptical of FDR and the New Deal. Right. You know, when Baker was a kid, he'd have to come down and perform for his parents' dinner parties, you know, reading uh, anti-FDR, anti-New Deal doggerel uh, for the performance basis. But they were Democrats. And so, but he was really a very apolitical person, not just because it was the family credo, but because I think he cared more about tennis and and hunting and, and, and dating and all the other things that young men uh, care about. Barbara Bush later joked that uh, Baker never actually went to vote on election day because that's when hunting season would open, which he denied. He says that's <laughs> yeah, not really yeah. true, but it's a good joke anyway. Yeah. And uh, he was, yeah, I mean, he was sort of a partier. I mean, he really, uh, he, he, he did go hunting a lot, a lot of boys trips. Uh, he was a member of the right wing club in college, but that wasn't a political organization. It was what you called it because you would take your beer and mm -hmm. you would, uh, you know. Yeah, that's right. But going back to Princeton a, a couple of years back in our narrative, he, he was out of control in mm -hmm. Princeton, truthfully. It was the first mm -hmm. time he'd been out of his father's orbit. And he wasn't not just a terrible student, but he was out of control. He was sounded to me from his description like he was drunk the whole time. He actually smashed one of his friend's hands in with a hammer uh, because he thought he would get him out of- um, A friend uh, asked, to be yeah. clear. One of the other students- Yeah, but would you do that? No, of course not. But one of the other <laughs> students, obviously not in fully in his capacity. This is I, the time for confession. No one is listening. I, I would yeah. never do But try, we try, we're trying to get out of, I don't think you try to get out this. of a test the next day or something like that. <laughs> try to beg everybody in the dorm to like whack his fingers and break his fingers with a stick or something. And the only one who would do it was, <laughs> was Baker. So it wasn't Isn't maybe. His something. So in any case, uh, George Bush begins running for office in the 1960s. And how much was Jim Baker involved with that? Really not. I mean, you know, he yeah. gave money, obviously he was supportive, but he, he was not a part of the campaign, really. And then, of course, the tragic story of Mrs. Baker and what happened. Tell the story. of Right. So Mary Stewart is Baker's first wife. They meet in college on the beach in Bermuda. And um, we found these old, he gave us these old letters, uh, the, the love letters between them, which were really very touching. And, and they're very much of the era. You know, he writes things like, I've got the A-bomb hots for you, you know, back mm -hmm. when A-bombs were a big thing. The screaming a -bomb. That's exactly what a future Secretary of State would write to his uh, yeah. beloved. Yeah, I mean, ironically, later in life, of course, he negotiates the START Treaty, which right, is- Right, right. Well, so psychological <laughs> motivation. <laughs> Maybe that was the initial uh, uh, motivation. But anyway, he, uh, they marry, they have four boys, and they, they build a house together in Houston. And she gets sick. She has cancer. And Bush at this time is about to run for Senate and give up his house seat. And he's trying to convince Baker to think about running for his house seat. And by then, the germ of politics has begun. This is 1970. Exactly. And, it's, and so Baker's thinking about it. He's thinking maybe that's not a bad idea. But then he discovers this, the, the, the cancer is terminal. And he writes his friend, George Bush, a letter explaining why he won't run for the house seat. And he says, George, basically, Mary Stewart's uh, diagnosis is terminal. And she doesn't know it. And I'm not telling her because I want her last months to be the best they can be. And I'm not telling my mother. And I'm not telling the kids. The only person he, in James Baker's life that he tells is George Bush. Boy, mm -hmm. that will be, that's the foundation of a lifelong friendship, right? You, don't, you forge a bond in a moment like that unlike any that you would otherwise have, I think. And, 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 and for Bush, of course, who had lost his own daughter to leukemia, you know, the, the, the family tragedy is, is all the more personal. And the last people who've seen Mary Stewart alive outside of the family are George and Barbara Bush. Mm. So George Bush said, you know, why don't you get involved in the campaign? 
and maybe it'll divert you a little bit. But what we all know about George Bush, you know, he would, he most charitable, lovely person on earth, but he would not have done that unless he saw the leadership qualities in Jim Baker that would be helpful. Uh, so he basically discovered Jim Baker for politics. That part I understand, you know, this very smart man, you know, hugely talented, hugely disciplined. What, it, what is harder to understand is, I mean, this is almost like something out of a fable. Why was Jim Baker drawn to make this enormous life change, if you think about it, get involved in politics, exactly what his family told him not to do, very different from the life he had planned for himself. What was going on here? You know, it is a, it is a good question that's not entirely answered, I think, Michael, but, th but the truth is, is that, as Peter said, the evidence is very clear that he already was contemplating running for the House himself before Mary Stewart died. So that cast the story, this uh, relatively familiar story in a slightly different light. It does suggest that he was looking at his life as a corporate lawyer uh, in Texas and- Getting, it, getting restless. Absolutely. I believe that, uh, you know, he, uh, was not at his father's firm. Uh, his father was fading by then. He had uh, Parkinson's. He was not in control in the same way. Uh, meanwhile, the world is changing. I mean, you know, the 1960s and the Vietnam War and tumult is happening all around him. He, on the surface, is unaffected by this. We found no letters or documents or records mm -hmm. of this, this turmoil in American society affecting him. But you have to imagine that it did. He had this very traditional life, this very traditional family, uh, no real prospect of anything changing at a time when the whole world seems to be changing. He was a bit dazzled also by George Bush, uh, especially in these years. You know, his friend had been a, a war hero, a naval aviator uh, in World War II. Uh, he had, uh, you know, launched himself on this political career with bright prospects. And was uh, talked about in Texas as a future president. President. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, he himself used that word dazzled with us uh, in describing uh, this older brother type relationship uh, with Bush. I think later it might have shifted. But so, you know, that's the context in which this momentous decision occurs. When did he change party affiliation? In, in that 1970 time frame. But they, he says to George, well, George, we got two problems. One, I don't know anything about politics. And two, I'm a Democrat. And Bush says, well, we can take care of the second part. <laughs> right. It's like the end of the movie, Some Like It Hot, No One's Perfect. Yes. Uh, <laughs> but that, that's exactly it. So he, he gets involved in the campaign. And how was it that he took to it? I mean, this is, it looked as if he had been preparing for this his whole life. He does. He becomes the Harris County chairman for the yep. Senate campaign. And they actually do pretty well in Harris County. That's his home area, of course. He knows the area pretty well. He knows the power brokers and the lawyers and all that. But um, it's his first taste of it. And you can see that he, he is, is hooked, right? It's, 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 it's engaging. It's competitive. It's all the things that he wants. And, and, and again, he, it, it is a salve for what's happening at home. He told us that this was such a painful period of his life that if he was ever going to become an alcoholic, it was this moments after Mary Stewart. And, and he very movingly tells you how much he was drinking. Yep. You know, everyone thinks of Jim Baker as this su supremely organized, self-disciplined person, but it's sort of like what you were talking about at Princeton. Exactly. It's, it's, it's a very different you know, real crisis. Right. And his nanny, who we, you know, we, uh, I told you, or maybe we didn't say, we, we interviewed his 106 year old nanny, B. Green, still around today. She's amazing. And she told us, you know, she would just find him at his house staring out the window in these days, kind of lost and trying to, trying to find himself. And it's, so it's understandable that you would jump into something as engaging as politics and find it kind of a, 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 a real balm in a moment like that. Yeah. So with the help of a great recommendation from George Bush, who by then was, can't remember, ambassador to the UN or RNC chairman, he becomes deputy secretary of commerce. And when does that happen? In 75. Okay, so in 75, China. he comes to Washington. He's barely been to Washington in his life, certainly has right. never worked here. And that's in 1975. By the summer of 1976, he's the <laughs> campaign manager of the president of the United States, Gerald Ford, who's running for reelection. I do not know a more meteoric rise in politics than that. You know, Gerald Ford, who had been in national life a long time, 
takes this neophyte who had never been involved in a national presidential campaign, who had been, you know, the three of us had met a lot of deputy secretaries of commerce. I've never met <laughs> any of them that, you know, looked as if they were in some cases even likely to become secretary of commerce, let alone campaign manager to the president. So what did Jerry Ford see in Baker that would have caused him to do that? Mm. Well, you know, it is, you're right to pinpoint this as the moment when he, he just went on rocket fuel, essentially. So he, and that's really the story from here on in, by the way, you know, that Baker goes on successively larger playing fields and finds himself thriving uh, in each situation. And so he finally gets to Washington and it's not just the accident of timing in his personal life, but there's the neutron bomb of Watergate has gone off and essentially destroyed the Republican party infrastructure, leaving uh, opportunities for uh, new Republicans like Baker and in Ford's White House, people like Don Rumsfeld and Dick Cheney. And I think it wasn't Jerry Ford, although I, Ford definitely uh, liked and, and, and came to respect Baker, it was Dick Cheney, uh, I think, who saw Baker's promise in this Commerce Department role and, and essentially plucked him out of there. Again, an accident of timing. Jerry Ford, as you know, with congressman from Grand Rapids, Michigan, and uh, he had like a very small political organization, right? He wasn't like a national political figure. Right. And he had never run for anything larger than a House seat. Absolutely, he had this guy who ran campaigns for him, uh, you know, back in Michigan to the extent he had them, he died in a tragic car accident in the middle of this campaign for mm. Ford to be president. And this turns out to be, and his job was to count delegates at the Republican convention. And of course, this turns out to be the last contested Republican convention yeah. ever. It actually matters. That yeah. job matters yeah. in 1976. The only time it ever right. matters. It doesn't matter anymore. Right. Then, yeah. And so Cheney, remembers this guy, Jim Baker, at Commerce, uh, and he's plucked out of there. And it's really, it's just an amazing story if you think about it. And of course, then he goes, he does a great job. The Reagan campaign team, uh, you know, is filled with BS, essentially. And John Sears, the campaign manager, is, you know, giving inflated totals for Reagan's delegate counts. Right. Uh, Baker earns a lot of credibility both with the campaign and also with the national political reporters uh, by sticking much closer to the facts. He's a natural wheeler dealer. Uh, he understands you got to get the Mississippi delegation. You got to do this. Clark you know, Reed. favors. He's Clark giving Reed. right exactly exactly. He's <laughs> giving uh, you know tickets to state dinners. Uh, you know and audiences. Yes, Reagan, Reagan said this was Santa Claus is coming to, to, to town. Right. That's right. Uh, one of the, the ones were very asked, incensed by that at the time. Pardon? One of the dogs that wanted him to actually fix the local sewer system or something like that. I mean, like, <laughs> right. it really, it was, he probably got to sit next to the queen at a state dinner. Or, that's right. <laughs> hopefully after washing his hands. Right. right. <laughs> yes, we have to say these days. <laughs> so in any case, uh, he was a brilliantly successful manager in that campaign because I think if Gerald Ford had not gone slightly astray in the second debate and said that Poland was not, uh, that Eastern Europe was not dominated by the Soviet Union, he would have gone from maybe a 20 or 30 point deficit behind Jer Jimmy Carter to get reelected. Right. And Jim Baker had a lot to do with that. Right. Fact, he came really about 10,000 votes short if you, de de depending on where you put Hawaii them, and Mississippi. In Ohio. I think, yeah, yeah. I think or, or Ohio you can do it another right. way. If yeah. you switch those two states just by a handful of votes, you get a victory for him. So. You know, it's, it's, that's so even though he loses, he impresses. Right, exactly right. So he's the manager of the losing campaign, although everyone gives him a lot of credit. And then, you know, if I were writing the story, I would not have predicted the next chapter, which is in 1978, he runs for attorney general of Texas. So what's that all about? <laughs> Well, I mean, I, I think having gotten bitten by the bug, he thinks he's going to be more like his friend George's trajectory. I, look, he was a terrible retail politician, which was probably good for Jim Baker and probably good for the country. Uh, and he, uh, you know, travels around the state. It's still a Democratic state. It is turning Republican, but it has not yet done so. Uh, he, and who was the opponent that year? Mark well, White. it was Mark yep. White, who later, governor. <laughs> later became governor right. and who was a very talented uh, uh, politician uh, in, in, in a way that Baker was not. Uh, the two became friends, by the way, of course. Would you consider Jim Baker an extrovert? That's a good question. He, uh, no. He, not really. No, I wouldn't. 
not tell, at all. Tell, this man tell. loves solitude in the outdoors. Yes. Okay. Right. The real thing about right. him, he's always described as a hunter, and he he just went elk hunting last week after recovering from coronavirus, amazingly enough, at the age of ninety. But I came to think that what he really loves is to be in. He's an outdoors man uh, as much as he's a hunter, uh, and that's really where he feels. I think most himself and most at peace in many ways, he's as much a Westerner uh, as a Southerner in that sense. And, and all the things you've just said, I would also say about Ronald Reagan. So in a way, I've always wondered if that was some, they understood each other a little bit better, basically introverts who were very accomplished at giving the impression of being an extrovert and loving being exactly. around people and politicians. Great way to put it. Yeah, he has enormous um, like emotional, like since so he's very very good at talking with different people uh but you know listen to the descriptions of someone like margaret tutwiller who uh worked so intimately and so closely with uh baker over you know his entire career really in public life from the 1980 uh campaign on or actually 1976 she was a young woman in the 76 campaign and you know her quote to us i think was amazing she said he's absolutely cold-blooded uh, you know, he is not. And this is from someone who loves and admires him. Oh, yeah, no, no. She, yeah. yeah, their own, you know, relationship was close, but yeah. that he is cold blooded, dispassionate, not guided by sentiment, uh, a, a hardcore realist in all of his analysis well, of people. And Bob Zellick, I think it was, who told us, look, yeah. you know, he worked for Baker in all these different jobs. Right. And he never called him anything other than Mr. Baker, never called him Jim. Mm -hmm. He doesn't think, and, and, and Baker not only didn't open up about his family, he didn't ask about Zellix either. He says, I'm not sure that he ever knew my wife's name for a lot of years. I mean, it just wasn't that kind of guy. He wasn't, a, you know, an open book. He was a business, all business kind of but guy. But doesn't that tell you a lot about someone who wanted to go into yes. politics and run for office? But at the same time, was able to build these relationships later on on Capitol Hill and with people in the press and... A this quick study to sort of quickly understand what people's motives are. Exactly. So I always thought of him as almost mathematical. Would that be right? That's right. He's an amazing processor of information. Mm -hmm. I think that's the thing to know about Jim Baker. He's, he's not needy in his relationships with other people? That's true. Well, not at all. In, in the sense that he understood exactly this is business. Right. And, you know, this is what you need to do to take care of those mm -hmm. reporters. Like I think you quote him. <laughs> Didn't he say that politics is a people business? Yeah, and that's right. It's and that's just sort of classic Baker. He's analyzing this in a very like an engineer. Way. Yeah, like an engineer. Yeah. He's figuring out an engineering problem. How do I get from here to there? It's like right. who was it? Hedrick Smith who used the uh, the billiards comparison. You know, he figured mm -hmm. out how the balls careened off each other, uh, but it wasn't it wasn't a uh, 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 it wasn't love of the balls. personal. <laughs> yeah, it was just very very mathematical. Yeah, this is not Hubert Humphrey who loves to be loved and goes to a or Bill Clinton. Or George Bush, who collected, no. you know, the, all the names of everybody he ever met, and you know, sure. Barbara kept them in her Christmas card list. But that's right. why he wasn't an electoral politician. He yeah. was a, he, you know, he was a, a, a natural power yeah. broker more than he was, he was a, Jim, a strategist. Jim Barlow, yeah. the Houston Chronicle reporter, who covered that '78 race. He said we would go to these. Uh, he said, first of all, he learned he taught Baker how to play gin rummy because they had these long hours on the plane flying around the state together and they wouldn't have anything to say. So he said he got to teach them how to play cards in order to fill the time. But they would go to these Texas state fairs. He said we would walk through the fair and Baker wouldn't stop anybody. He didn't like to take hands with anybody. So I'm Jim Baker. He had straight to the tent where the power broker or as the local county judge or something and figured out what that person needed and what mm -hmm. he could do to get that person's support. Tells you everything. But the interesting thing is that at that stage of his life, I don't think he knew it himself because he still had his, a political career possibly in mind for himself later on. Yeah. One moment you do real justice to and tell the story, he was George Bush's campaign manager in 1980. And George Bush was about to get to a point where it was ma mathematically impossible for him to get the delegates to defeat Ronald Reagan. He wanted to push on and basically almost against his will, Jim Baker pulls him out of the race. Well, now that tells a lot about that relationship and also his judgment, tell us. Yeah, I think that's right, that you know, Baker essentially jammed up, you could argue, uh, his friend Bush. Now, he would say in service of the you know, more strategic goal, they understood that uh, Bush was not going to win the, the primary. He had certainly done far better uh, than they initially thought and really turned himself into a, the principal challenger of Ronald Reagan. But you know, it was clear Reagan was going to win. And, but Bush wanted to fight on. Uh, Baker essentially 
leaks to the Washington Post, we can't compete in California. We don't have any money. We're not, you know, we're closing our office there. That's tantamount to saying the campaign is over. Uh, and Baker has still had in mind the goal of getting Bush on the ticket. And he knew that if they fought too long or too hard against Reagan, that would be a problem. Remember, Bush has already called uh, uh, Reagan essentially a charlatan uh, and said he's peddling voodoo economics uh, on the American people, a quote that lives on to this day. In a debate it, in Texas. That's right. And Baker was not happy about that uh, because he already thought that could compromise Bush's chances. Uh, Why but, provoke Reagan? Exactly. So when this story comes out, the Bush family and Bush personally is furious. You know, you're not out here on the road with me. You don't, you know, Barbara Bush uh, really held it against him too. Uh, but of course, it turned out to be the right decision. And had he not done that, he probably would not have been on that ticket. That's right. All right, another moment. We've got about 20 more minutes, so I want to make sure that we give justice to everything. Uh, he's hired by Ronald Reagan as chief of staff, which was astounding to people because Ronald Reagan had a wife who was somewhat known for remembering grudges and those who had crossed her husband. So Jim Baker had been, you know, manager for Gerald Ford, who had defeated Ronnie in 1976 manager for George Bush that had run, who had run, given Ronnie trouble in the primaries in 1980. Yet, she loved Jim Baker. She, she loved the way he looked. She <laughs> loved the way that he treated people. She loved his enormous sense, uh, his enormous abilities. And even Nancy Reagan, with all those feelings, was, was able to see through all that and say, this is someone who can be very useful to my husband in the White House. What was going on there? No, I think it's right. In, in this case, Nancy Reagan is that county judge in the tent in the back of the fair, right? He mm -hmm. understands who he needs to get on his side in order to be successful. She now, had he, little power in the entourage. Right, exactly. Now, he also understands that he's, he's not the one to necessarily uh, take care of the, uh, the care and feeding of Mrs. Reagan, and he makes sure Deaver does it. Michael Deaver, right. of course, knew her, had been really part of the family almost, for so many years in California. And he, he recognized immediately that Deaver would be the best envoy, the best intermediary with Mrs. Reagan. And he assigned him to it, basically. You're in charge of the first lady. And, and made Deaver his deputy, which Deaver probably no other chief of staff would have done. Right, because- I mean, they, Deaver was a lovely person, but not a, a towering figure in California. Exactly, exactly. But a towering figure in the Reagan orbit, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you're going to manage the Reagan orbit, you want a Mike Deaver on your side. All right, so Reagan has a very successful first term, gets reelected. How much of Reagan's success as president in that first term can be owed, at least in part, to Jim Baker? Well, look at what happened in the second term without him, right? <laughs> That's sort of the best argument for, uh, for tell, why. Tell, tell, tell what happened for those who don't remember. Well, I mean, you know, what, what's interesting is that Baker is widely held to be sort of the gold standard of White House chiefs of staff. He manages, uh, you know, every day he's in that White House, as someone put it to us, he acquired power and others lost it. Uh, you know, so Mies is really outclassed, Al Hay, he gets rid of them all. But actually he was miserable. He hated it. It was a grueling job. Uh, at one point he engineers uh, a job swap for himself where he is going to not only vanquish his enemies, but also become national security advisor, screws up, a rare Jim Baker screw up because uh, in Washington, uh, you know, high level intrigue, uh, he made the fatal mistake of losing sight at the president uh, uh, and not keeping at his side at a critical moment uh, and his enemies were able to derail this. But They clearly, were basically able to say he wasn't a true Reagan conservative, he's too much of a moderate and globalist. Absolutely, you'll have a rebellion on your hands, Mr. President, if you uh, go through with this. Mm -hmm. uh, especially because foreign policy at that time uh, and national security was where the real ideologues were, which of course would come back to haunt Reagan in the second term. And, and in that first term, he was trying to impress the Russians with how tough we could be to get them to the table. Absolutely, and you know that this is when the proxy wars in Central America are heating up, and Baker, even then, is very wary of them, uh, which you know I found fascinating. Mm -hmm. You know, this sort of little hints of foreboding. So, you know, he wanted to get out. Uh, Don Regan calls him up. He's the Treasury Secretary. Uh, they win re-election. He's he's furious with Baker for one or another leak, uh, screaming at him. He's going to quit. 
I, the net result of which was a lunch between the two of them that Baker had to smooth things over at which they both confessed they'd love to switch jobs. <laughs> and they engineer this remarkable, uh, okay, fine, I'll just come on over here and you go on over there. Uh, and do, you think he, do you think he suspected how bad Regan would turn out to be in that role? He swears no. We asked yeah. him just yes. because people like, even like Stuart Spencer. I, I know or, what he says. I'm asking you what. <laughs> I think, you know what? I think it's one of these things where like, he might have suspected it, but he was so intent on getting out. Right, yeah. right. That it was, you know, he just had to find a way out. And of hated people. being thought of as an operative. Exactly. Well, that's exactly right. I, don't, I, I actually am a little bit dubious of the more overt, you know, conspiracy theory that he engineered the whole thing just to, you know, make himself look good. No, no, no. I, 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 do, I do not subscribe to that at all. Yeah. I, I'm just saying that, you know, did he understand how flawed Regan was? That's all. That's he, he, I think he might have, yeah. but I think he allowed himself to not focus on that. Regan was at least plausible. He was a credible person to send over to Reagan in effect and say, if you take this guy, I'll take this job. And, and a second know. term without a big agenda. Yeah, yeah. Well, and the big agenda actually was following him to, to Treasury, right? The biggest right. thing that he wanted to do at that point of his presidency was redo the tax code, yeah. which is going to be Baker's job. Sure. All right. So Baker becomes Secretary of the Treasury. Then George Bush is going to run in 1988. And he goes into the campaign. He would have preferred not to. Sort of like I remember, was it 1992? Uh, no, 1988. There was a Time magazine cover which says the year of the handlers. Yes. And it has Jim Baker and John Sasso, who later was fired by Dukakis for having done things he should not have done. And is it Margaret Tutwiler who says Baker almost threw up when he saw that? Yeah, he hated That's what he was trying to get away from. Exactly, the last thing he wanted to be was a handler. He had been right. a handler. He didn't want to be that again. That's right. And, you know, and yet uh, Bush, that was the price of entry uh, for becoming Secretary of State. And, Absolutely. you know, look, I have to say, when we've been talking with people about the book, it's really interesting how, uh, you know, that 1980 campaign, the searing negativity, uh, you know, and that it really is extraordinary. I mean, you could see in that a sort of a, a harbinger of what we've become politically. And Baker, again, the cold eyed realist, they were 17 points down coming out of the convention. And that is actually when Baker comes in to the campaign. Uh, you know, the campaigns lasted a lot less long than they do now. Yeah. 17 points down to Dukakis. They basically, the only way for Bush to win was to destroy uh, Michael Dukakis and to turn him, a mild-mannered, you know, Greek centrist technocrat from Massachusetts into, you know, a wild-eyed uh, threat to the country who hated the Pledge of Allegiance and, you know, was loved criminals who were going to come and, you know, kill you or rape you or something. And um, Baker absolutely signed off on it, absolutely knowing, absolutely cold-blooded about it. And that it was- Distinguished between campaigning and governing. Well, that's the truth. Exactly. I mean, that's one of the differences between today, right? At that time, campaigning could be ugly and it could be dirty or it could be mean or whatever, but it was a means to an end. It was a means to get to the place where you could do something in, in office. Today, right. unfortunately, it seems like governing is only about setting up the next campaign. Right. Look at the COVID right. relief, right? We, we, you know, we talk about Baker as a deal maker. It's hard to imagine six months going by, as we've now seen in Washington, without a deal even though both sides recognize that it's necessary to do something to help all the people who are in trouble. Baker would never have let that happen, I don't think. Uh, no, no question. So uh, he is basically the first major personnel announcement that the new president-elect makes, president-elect George Bush, in 1988 to be Secretary of State, and he meant very much to send a message there. I was trying to think, do you know of a president and secretary of state who were ever closer than these two guys in American history? Well, this is a question we have for you, Michael, as a much more <laughs> expert American I'm, I just ask questions. I don't, Peter I don't know and I have been arguing over whether Jefferson and Madison is a good example or were they actually friends or not. So maybe you can tell us. There was a, I think there was not as much equality as there was between Bush and Baker. They weren't as personally close. Right. I mean, Madison was significantly younger. Madison right? was very deferential, but yeah. yeah. Protégé. More like a scribe. Yeah. And, you know, and the I personal, often... They never played cu customer tennis together, as far as I know. <laughs> no, I think you're right. If you think about it, no other American Secretary of State and President so close, and probably no other Cabinet Secretary except maybe Bobby Kennedy and Jack Kennedy, right? I mean, yes. I, that's the only parallel I can think of with a President and somebody in the Cabinet who was just so tight with him. I totally agree with you. 
So if you're looking at those four years and what happened in foreign policy, I mean, I will start by saying that was one of the most important and productive periods in foreign policy in American history. And I believe that had George Bush not been president, had Jim Baker not been Secretary of State, there could have been a very different result than what did happen, which was the Cold War ended on terms that every president from Harry Truman on could only have dreamt of and thought would never happen without firing a shot. So what did it mean that Jim Baker was Secretary of State? Yeah, I think that's the right framing. Uh, you know, we went back and probably that was our original interest in doing the book in the first place. And uh, it really renews your, your sense that the individual matters uh, in history, uh, and that uh, what we now think of as inevitable uh, was much more fraught at the moment. For example, German unification, I think, is sort of the pinnacle of Baker's diplomacy. Uh, you know, people often talk about it, putting together the coalition for the Gulf War. Absolutely, but this is the precursor moment, and it really might not have happened. Uh, there was no plan and playbook in place for this kind of unification talks to happen in such a way, because actually uh, the State Department, when he came in just a few months earlier said, it's a pipe dream, we love the idea, not gonna happen. Uh, and many people were saying, we've been using the rhetoric, we want a unified Germany, but we don't really mean it because we're scared of a unified Germany. Absolutely, and those included Margaret Thatcher, right. uh, Francois Mitterrand, yep. uh, they had fought two world wars against Germany and they were dead set against it. And Thatcher also personally uh, did not like Jim Baker and did not trust him. Uh, she was part of the sort of uh, Reaganite true believers of faction in Washington. And they had the you know, hardcore conservatives back in Washington uh, who were very skeptical of Bush and Baker and felt that they would give away too much. And you had Gorbachev uh, for the Soviets who was under enormous pressures that would eventually lead to a coup by the hardliners. Sure, what if that sure. had happened sooner? And then, as if it weren't crazy enough, you had the West Germans who hated each other. And right. you had Chancellor Helmut Kohl and the foreign minister, Hans Dietrich Genscher, they literally were not on speaking terms. So he had to do all of this with two Germans from the one country who didn't get along. And then a rotating cast of basically as East Germany collapsed, uh, you know, there was like a new leader every week. Basically. Having been in Texas politics, he was accustomed to everyone trying to kill one another. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Something like that, yeah. Yep. yeah. But that was so, the pinnacle of his diplomacy, I think. Yeah, I think. And, and how much of it also was, I mean, I felt this at the time, I felt this even more when, when I was reading your book, which I've done twice closely, his ability to build relationships with people that are very different from him. I mean, Edward Shevardnadze, right. Foreign Minister to Gorbachev, if you had to think of two people on the globe that you wouldn't exactly put in the same room together, but they got along extremely well, and they did a lot of good together. Well, he was, Baker was and is somebody who um, floats between worlds, right? And inhabits the one that he's in and it's, and it's authentic, it's not fake. So, you know, Lauren Craner, who was his legislative affairs guy told us that he, Baker would go up to the hill and he would visit Jesse Helm and the two of them would sit there and, and, and shoot the whatever about uh, duck hunting or whatever, right? They do the good old boy stuff. And then he'd go next door and sit down with Chris Dodd, the Senator from Connecticut, they talk about opera. And it's important to remember that Baker grew up in Texas, but was educated in the East in Princeton and Hill, the Hill School. And he adapts to these environments. So he could go to a black tie dinner in Washington and feel very at home. And the next day go out and, you know, chew tobacco and, and, and go fishing for long stretches uh, with his pal Dick Cheney. And so when he meets Eric Shevardnadze, you're right, there couldn't be two more different ministers in the world. And yet you're, I think you're, your, your, your point is right on target, which he manages to connect with a guy despite the completely different backgrounds. Takes him to Wyoming, shows him his world. Shevardnadze takes him to Siberia, shows him his world. Did he and teach Shevardnadze fly fishing? He did. And of all the scenes we did not expect to see? We had in fact, one of Baker's aides said, boy, I can't tell you how hard it was to translate hip waiters into Russian. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it was a way of bonding. Probably something that Stalin put on people he wanted to send away. Right. Yeah, exactly. So finally they got past the talking points, right? Uh -huh. talk yeah, no, that's exactly right. And I think in retrospect, if we wanted qualities in a secretary of state in the early, in the late eighties, early nineties, you'd want someone who was able to build a relationship with a Soviet foreign minister so that they have the degree of confidence that would let them 
you know, agree to the unification of Germany and all those other things, right? And the payoff, of course, is Iraq, right? Yep. You know? Yeah, I mean, I think there was a palpable sense that they were together building uh, a post-Cold War order. And so when uh, they managed to achieve the unthinkable of German reunification, that's exactly the moment at which Saddam invades Kuwait. And in fact, you know, inside the State Department, there was a memo that said, this is literally the first test of the new post-Cold War order. And Baker fortuitously happens to already be on that side of the world flies to Moscow, and he and Shevardnadze, it's extraordinary, appear together to denounce the invasion. You know, for the last 50 years prior to that, the world has been divided into, right. you know, a bipolar uh, environment in which you're either with them or you're with us. And all the proxy wars, all that. And in a one breathtaking moment, everyone realizes, it's not just about the Middle East at this point, right? Everyone understands in, in Africa and Latin America, this is a new world order right here. If the US and the Soviets stay together, this aggression will not stand. And that was really a product of Baker personally convincing Shevardnadze to get on board. The, the two men are physically the manifestation of this, this mm -hmm. new order. Yes, and it al almost makes you cry to think about the hopes yeah. that we all had for the world. Uh, someone we all know who wrote a book about the end of history because now that there were not great power conflicts, there wouldn't be any need to write history anymore. So in any case, uh, I think we can finish this in about seven minutes. Have you got seven minutes left? We're I think good. we wanted to end it at eight, but can everyone watching stay on for a few more minutes? <laughs> I don't want to leave you in suspense about what happens in the rest of this life. Uh, fall of 92, George Bush is running for reelection and asks Jim Baker to make at least a temporary career change. What happens? Well, it's the most unhappy career change of, of Baker's life. He really, he resists it for months. Baker, Bush doesn't want to ask him. He's proud. He doesn't want to have to need Baker. This is part of the sibling rivalry. And Baker doesn't want to go back to being a handler. He doesn't want that Time Magazine cover again. He's negotiating Middle East peace. And he doesn't want to go back to deciding what kind of confetti was going to be falling from the convention halls. But eventually, of course, it's inevitable. Everybody knows uh, that Baker has to go back. And he does. But he's literally crying on the day he leaves the State Department. I mean, he had tried to dummy up a right. fake last minute Middle East peace mission just to get out of it. And it didn't work. And so he, it's, a, it's a failed effort. The, there's some sourness there on, with the Bushes who feel like maybe he didn't really fully put in everything he could have, Mrs. Bush especially. Uh, and it's sort of a sad coda, I think, to their, to their time together at the Heights after all they had done, after all they had accomplished to kind of go out this way and a kind of Winston Churchill, thanks very much for the war kind of fa farewell, was, this, I think, a sour moment. Yeah, it, it was very hard. But he leaves office and had at least some idea of running for president in 1996. What happened there? Well, you know, it's interesting. We asked him, of course, about that. And he, you know, he had kept a file for years, like random people would send him letters saying, you know, you would make a great president or you should run for president. He kept that file all those years. You know, it was something that he had thought of. Uh, you know, there were obviously times when he would look at his friend George and think, you know, well, I could do that or I could do that better or I am doing that. Uh, and so I do think he looked at it in 1996 and he says to us, well, I was tired. I'd been working on, you know, and luckily we were having this interview with his wife, Susan, at his side. And she said, well, honey, you know, the real truth is that the party had left you. You, you couldn't, you know, run and win in 1996. You know, you were too liberal for the party at this time. And she didn't mean ideologically liberal, but this was the Gingrich era. This was the politics of zero sum confrontation in your face, make no quarter for Democrats. Jim Baker- It was against almost everything you've written about in this book. That's right, yeah. that's right. So that's you know, why for, for people who do not know what this was like, younger people, my son is reading it now, who's, whom you know, who is now 24. And to him, this is like reading about a different planet. <laughs> the fact that he had these friends on the other side and yeah. got people in Congress to, to do what they should. Yeah, absolutely. Bob Strauss from Texas, his best right. buddy, chairman of the Democratic Committee, for heaven's sakes. Right. Imagine that today. Yeah, no, it's, it's completely different. Uh, so two more moments and then I'm done. Uh, 2000, as you write, whatever coolness might have been between Secretary Baker and 
President Bush, and, and particularly, as you say, Mrs. Bush, evaporated in part because of his role in the recount. Tell about that. Right, exactly. So George W. Bush is running for president. He doesn't want his dad's team around, obviously. He needs to be right. his own guy. So Baker's no part of the campaign. But on election night, when suddenly it comes down to a few hundred votes in, tech, in Florida, who's the one guy he wants? The one guy he wants, of course, is Jim Baker, who readily gets on a plane the next day and for 36 days manages the recount there. And the Democrats told us as soon as they knew Baker was, was picked that they, they knew they were toast, that Baker had this aura of success and you know, political uh, uh, genius that, that Warren Christopher, as, as much as everybody respected him and thought he was a very dignified, serious person, didn't have on the Democrats. Maybe not quite the same level. Not the same level, no. He, 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 Warren Christopher approaches it like a Geneva a negotiation with the Russians. He's going to have this proposal where these two wise men will, just, will settle the issue. And Baker's like, I'm here because my candidate won, and I'm, not, I'm here to preserve his victory, not to negotiate. Right. And it succeeded, and George W. Bush became president and was grateful to him for his, his championship in Florida. And then one final moment, and even to, to speed through this book at 500 miles an hour, as we've done for, for an hour, doesn't even begin to scratch the surface. But maybe the last major moment is that in the late part of the first decade of this century, the Iraq war is not going well. And who, whom does George W. Bush turn to? Yeah, that's right. So the, the Iraq study group was a product of, you know, the sort of the, the disaster of uh, Iraq not turning out uh, on the ground as it should be, and of course, the collapse of the political rationale behind it as well. Interestingly, Baker was opposed to the war in Iraq from the beginning, but unlike Brent Scowcroft, who had been uh, the national security advisor for George H.W. Bush uh, and you know published an op-ed piece before the invasion that, that really was a, a rupture with uh, uh, George W. Bush and Condoleezza Rice, they were furious with Scowcroft. They felt sandbagged. They felt it was some, it was being interpreted as a message uh, from the first President Bush to his son. Baker really had a very similar views to Scowcroft. Uh, and yet he managed to, in his own op-ed piece, uh, to sort of thread the needle much more carefully. There never was. Uh, it, it didn't look, if, if the president had brought in Scowcroft, it would look as if you're sort of eating a humble, humble pie where Bush Baker did not put himself in a situation. Exactly. Where Even though his views, again, he was very clear, I think, right. about the risks of doing that. We went and interviewed President George W. Bush about it, and, and we said, you know, like, Scowcroft wrote yeah. this, and then Baker wrote this. He says, well, I remember Scowcroft, but I don't remember the Baker one. Like, Baker had written it in such a way that it didn't get into his craw, right? He mm -hmm. didn't, you know, anger him and, 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 and burn the bridge. Yeah, yeah. no, re really interesting. So we've got about two or three more minutes. So... You know, your son is young. My, my children are a little bit older. What should they know about Jim Baker? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not impossible to get things done in Washington, as you said. I mean, that's the part uh, that I think is so amazing in the context of this current dysfunction is to understand, you know, that there's a way uh, to govern from and to look for the points of agreement and not just the points of disagreement. And we talk about this polarization as if it's inevitable, as if it, uh, you know, is, is just Permit. destined to last forever. Uh, but, the, but the truth is, is that uh, it's not. Uh, perhaps it is uh, in this current administration. I do think that even a Jim Baker would have an impossible time. You, you can't manage an unmanageable president. Uh, but I do think that you could probably find a, a lot of areas where 80% of Americans agree on something concrete to get done. Uh, and then the other thing is that the world, uh, you know, doesn't always look the way that it looks today. And, right. you know, you talked about, I mean, 1989 for young people, they don't understand. It was a miraculous time. Uh, it seemed as though, uh, you know, Frank Fukuyama wasn't crazy. To write I just, I'd get <laughs> choked up even thinking about it. You no, know, And, you know, somebody yeah. said to me recently, Michael, that, you know, it actually 1989 was the best year of our lives. We just mm -hmm. didn't know it at the time. Right. Right. And, you know, it seemed as though, you know, freedom and democracy was winning. Uh, I mean, the, the velvet... President Bush said in his inaugural, the day of the dictator is over. 
That's mm -hmm. exactly right. Not uh, something he would say today, I'm sorry to say. No, no, that's right. And so, you know, it really was a moment and trying to understand what we did right and what we didn't do right at this moment of maximum uh, advantage for the United States in the world when the chance to shape a better order uh, existed. Uh, you know, now is another one of those hinge points in history, I would say. And we don't know how it's going to turn out yet. So I find this to be very, very relevant. Me too, and so will everyone who's watching us tonight. The <laughs> book, The Man Who Ran Washington, uh, available at fine bookstores everywhere, as well as Amazon and other online sellers. Uh, all I can say, it's one of the best books I've ever read. I loved it. I read it a second time because it's like, you know, watching Citizen Kane. The second time you notice things that you didn't see <laughs> the first time, that, that's what's true of a great work of art. So thank you for writing it. Thank you for sharing this time. Thank you to the George and Barbara Bush Foundation for hosting this. Everyone run out, buy 10 copies, read it 10 times. Thank you all for being with us and everyone please stay safe. Thank Michael, you, Michael. Thank you so much.